So here we are looking at the small intestine. Now, the small intestines are the most important digestive organ as far as digestion goes. Everyone thinks it's the stomach, but more digestion actually takes place here in the small intestine. It's also where around 90% of absorption takes place. So a super important organ. It's of course all coiled up. It's about six meters long, so we have to tuck that all in there somewhere. Um, it comes in three regions. We have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Duodenum means mixing bowl. So here is where the stomach would be dumping contents into the intestines, right, in this first region. And it's also where secretions from the pancreas and the liver enter as well. So at the duodenum, we get contents of the stomach, pancreas, and liver all getting mixed together. It's a pretty short section. We then move into the jejunum. This is actually where most digestion and absorption takes place. And then the longest region is the ileum. It ends at the ileocecal valve. That's the junction between the ileum and the first part of the large intestine, which is the cecum. Okay, so when we think about the small intestine, what we're gonna see is that it is entirely super, I shouldn't say entirely, super focused on absorption. And so one of the things that we see is there's this major emphasis on increasing surface area so that the absorption of nutrients um, happens a little bit easier. So for example, they're showing you um, a bit of a cross section here. We have throughout the intestines these ridges called the plica circularis. These don't stretch out, they're just little um, ridges that are going to increase surface area. On top of those plica circularis, notice that the entire in inner region of the intestine, the mucosa, is covered in villi, right? These projections. So these intestinal villi are just these tiny projections, again, to dramatically increase surface area, right? It increases the surface area, something like 600 fold um, that it would have without those. And actually, if you laid all your intestines out and all these little bumps and ridges out, um, you'd have about 2,200 square feet. You might compare that to a house that you can think of. 2,200 square feet of surface area for absorption. Um, okay, so these villi, this is awesome. Okay, we got the plica circularis ridges, villi, little ridges, and if you zoom in on the villi, when you look at these simple columnar cells, guess what? They have micro villi. You'll be able to see that hopefully um, in the histology in lab. So again, it's all about surface area. I guess we can stay there. So when we think about these intestinal villi, um, you'll notice a couple things, right? Again, simple columnar epithelium. These do have microvilli for that surface area. Um, on our villi, we see lots of mucus cells. Again, the contents as they're coming in from the stomach or even some of these secretions, these enzymes coming from the pancreas would really be damaging to the walls of the intestines without this layer of mucus. So lots and lots um, of mucus cells. Now, in the lamina propria, right, that underlying areolar connective tissue, still in this mucosa layer, we see this really rich network of capillaries. And it is important to note that all of the blood that comes through the digestive system, right? So you can see the oxygenated blood, you can picture that delivering oxygen to the cells, removing carbon dioxide, but also now in this venous side, we should be full of nutrients, right? Any glucose, amino acids, these nutrients that are getting absorbed in the digestive tract. This is all going to go to the hepatic portal system. Remember that one? 
Paddock Portal. Right? So hepatic means liver. Good. And then a portal system, remember we saw this in the from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. You had a network of capillaries, and then it went to another network of capillaries. We're doing the same thing here. This portal system, we're gonna have a set of capillaries here in the small intestines, and that is going directly to the liver where there will be another set of capillaries because the liver needs to get all these nutrients out of the blood and decide what to do with them. Okay, so here in our, micro, uh, in our villi, we have lots um, of capillaries. We also have these lymph capillaries. Remember, in the intestines, we call them lacteals. Um, and part of the reason they're called lacteals, so what, what these are for is lipids, the fatty acids that we absorb, actually don't go into the capillaries. They have to get... Uh, they have to travel through the lymphatic system. And so like this kind of lact makes me think like lactose or milk. The, the lymph coming out of here because it's carrying so many lipids actually ends up kind of having a milky white appearance. And so that's how they got their name. So these lacteals are carrying fatty acids. We'll talk about that um, some more. And then you also see um, the nerves and those sorts of things. Okay, zooming back out so that we can see our whole kind of scheme here for the intestines. We were just looking at these villi. Notice that at the base of each villi, there's this indent. Um, sometimes you'll see them called intestinal crypts. I think intestinal gland is the more common name now. And so these are at the base of the villi. Um, at the very bottom of these, you have a set of cells that are constantly regenerating these simple columnar epithelial cells, right, to keep moving up and covering the villi, replacing those cells. Intestinal epithelia are actually pretty short-lived. They're going to get damaged, sloughed off, um, those sorts of things. So we're constantly replacing those. Um, we also, let's see, new epithelial cells. Let's do this. The other thing with these epithelial cells, when you look at them, right, we said they actually have these microvilli. So sometimes this actually is referred to as the brush border. And so we'll talk about brush border enzymes. And these are typically the final step of digestion before absorption takes place. So you'll have things like sucrose, a disaccharide. In order to actually get into the cell, it has to be as a monosaccharide, as glucose. And so in these microvilli, you'll place these enzymes. So these cells end up being shed um, at the surface and need to kind of uh, be replaced pretty frequently. The other thing that you might notice on here um, are these lymphoid nodules. Remember we talked about GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, right, a form of malt. Um, and here in the intestines, they're often referred to as payers patches, um, but it's, it's the same idea, right? It's this lymphoid tissue where we're trying to screen um, for microbes. Um, and again, you have a ton of microbes in the intestines, um, and particularly in the large intestine, you harbor some ones that are only good when they're in the large intestine, like E. coli. Um, and so you'll find really rich amounts um, of this lymphoid tissue, particularly at, like in the ileum, as we get closer to the large intestine um, to kind of protect us from those microbes moving into areas that they shouldn't be. So sorry, payers, patches, right, or galt is fine, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, um, and that's what they're calling here, this lymphoid nodule. Okay. Oh, there's a nice, right? So this is, 
that lymphoid tissue really, really abundant here. Okay, so then before we leave um, the small intestine, right, do keep in mind that throughout this six meters of small intestine, we are adding secretions, um, we have all sorts of mucus being added in here, um, and we end up making about two liters of these intestinal juices, right? And again, things like mucus, enzymes, right, the secretions um, of the pancreas and the liver, we'll talk about those more. And then a big component of this as well is just having food in the intestines it has this large osmotic draw, right? It's attracting water and water is getting pulled in here. Sometimes more than others. So for example, if you're lactose intolerant, if you drink milk, this lactose, which is a disaccharide, doesn't get broken down and so it's never absorbed. As it's hanging out then in the intestines, more water is getting pulled in. And so often people with lactose intolerance, lactose is gonna give them diarrhea, um, uncomfortable, things like that. So before we move on to the large intestine, I think this is a good spot to talk about our accessory organs because the small intestine is where the pancreas and liver are adding their secretions. The pancreas is an accessory organ to the digestive system, but it is hugely important, right? So we've talked about the pancreas before, but all we talked about was the 1% of the pancreas that had an endocrine function. Do you remember what hormones the pancreatic islets make? Insulin and glucagon, right, to regulate blood glucose. Well now, we need to talk about the other 99% of the pancreas, and it is an exocrine gland. Right? So all the rest of the tissue in the pancreas here, these pancreatic um, acini, are exocrine. I like this little cartoon version, right? Look at these cute little cuboidal cells, lots of simple cuboidal cells. And they are all producing enzymes. All of their uh, secretions are going to dump together into a series of ducts, which we eventually see the pancreatic duct, right, entering into the duodenum, right? Um, we make all sorts of interesting thing here, things here. Overall, what this exocrine pancreas is producing is an alkaline mixture of enzymes, water, ions, right, and this alkaline, sorry, lots of arrows, this alkaline component, we are actually putting bicarbonate and phosphate buffers in uh, to the duodenum. Bicarbonate Right? And these buffers, this is on purpose, right? Because the hydrochloric acid in the stomach would be very damaging to the intestines. And so right at the beginning of the intestine here, boom, we are gonna bring the pH up towards neutral, right? As far as the enzymes go, I am gonna run out of room. As far as the enzymes go, there is a huge list, right? Vastly important. So we have things like pancreatic, alpha amylase, right? Um, amylase, you saw that in the saliva, it's still breaking down sugars, carbohydrates, Sorry, let's go carbohydrates, right? More complex 
um, molecules. We also have a pancreatic lipase, right, to continue the breakdown of lipids. We saw a lipase in the mouth, right, but a slightly different form. Um, we also have nuclease. It breaks down nucleic acids. It breaks down DNA and RNA, right, in the foods that you eat. Um, we also then have some what we call proteolytic enzymes. We have protease. And protease is really like a, a category of um, enzymes that are breaking down proteins into polypeptides. And then we also have peptidase that's going to take those polypeptides and go even further to like a dipeptide. Right? And again, these two together we call proteolytic. Enzymes, the proteolytic enzymes, the proteases and the peptidases break down protein. Typically, these are going to be released as an inactive form, um, right, that's then going to be activated so that it doesn't actually start damaging the cells that are producing these enzymes. Damaging your pancreas can actually be a life threatening emergency. So, that could be from like blunt trauma, or it could just be blocking this pancreatic duct. Um, as those enzymes back up, they will start to digest this like autolysis um, of the pancreas. And so this um, is, of course, problematic. On to the liver. Now, the liver is another accessory organ, just like the pancreas, but this is actually your largest internal organ, right? Now, recall that the blood supply was coming through this hepatic portal circulation. So when we look at the microscopic arrangement of the liver, right, we'll notice a couple things. There are arteries. There's a hepatic artery that is bringing fresh oxygenated blood to the liver. That's like a third of the blood supply. The other two thirds of the blood coming to the liver is through that hepatic portal system, right? And so from here, what we're going to, I guess that's the portal um, vein as well. What we're going to see is that the, the blood starts to move out of there and into um, all these lobules of the liver, right? And we are going to bring this blood in really close contact to the, all the liver cells, right? It's actually going through these sinusoidal capillaries, right? Really easy, free movement um, of materials. Anything then can be absorbed into these hepatocytes, these liver cells. And the hepatocytes are going to figure out what needs to be done with the materials passing through here, right? The, the blood, once those nutrients and wastes and toxins, all these things are removed, enters this central vein. The central vein is gathering all the really done spent blood out of the liver, um, and it's going to take that to the hepatic vein, not the portal vein, but vein, and into the inferior vena cava, right? So when we look at this, um, sorry, maybe there's a better, so there's the hepatic vein entering the inferior vena cava. We'll come back to that picture. Now, really interesting uh, kind of setup here histologically, but it makes a lot of sense, right? The liver is filtering this vast amount of blood. And that is because the, li the liver has so many functions. I just want to encourage you to be nice to your liver. Um, it does three main things. And I, we, we clump this together. You can break it apart however you want. We say the liver is the center of metabolic regulation. So we'll see how it deals with lots of different nutrients. We will talk about the liver as the center of hematologic 
regulation. So dealing with the blood, remember it made a lot of those proteins, plasma proteins. And then it also produces bile. Okay. Each of these is going to have a million things. The liver is super important, right? Let's look at metabolic regulation. So again, here we're thinking a lot about how the liver is going to handle those nutrients, right? That are coming through the portal system from primarily the small intestines, but large intestine stomach as well. It all goes directly to the liver and the liver gets to decide what to do. Right? So when it's carbohydrate, when it's glucose, right, that arrives at the liver, um, these cells are going to make some decisions, right? Maybe we take that glucose and we store it in the form of glycogen. Or maybe we have plenty of glycogen, and so we go ahead and convert glucose into fatty acids, right? So we can build triglycerides and store that energy even longer, right? Sometimes there's not enough glucose for the liver, uh, for the, the brain uh, to use, and so the liver decides, hey, we need more glucose. It can actually do this process called gluconeogenesis, right? And this is literally like origins of new glucose. The liver is able to take lipids and proteins and convert them into glucose. So it can make glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, lipids. The liver is also in charge of this metabolic regulation um, of lipids. It determines the circulating levels of all sorts of fun lipids. Things like uh, triglycerides, fatty acids, which are a nice um, fuel that we can use and also cholesterol, right? So it's actually the liver that's determining things like um, how many HDLs versus how many LDLs. We can talk about that a bit more, um, right? Cholesterol levels, what's actually circulating in the bloodstream, right? It's able to store and release um, these lipids. And do remember, these lipids aren't coming to the liver through the hepatic portal system, right? These are actually traveling um, through the, the lymphatic system, okay? We also will see the liver decide what to do with proteins. So just think about your three macromolecules and the liver is making these uh, decisions, right? So basically, we're gonna, the liver is going to receive protein in the form of amino acids, right? That's how it's being absorbed. And the liver decides, well, what do I do with these amino acids, right? Do I go ahead and build protein out of them, right? Or do I need to use them for something like gluconeogenesis um, to uh, create more sugars, those sorts of um, things, right? So it can convert that to protein. It, of course, we just mentioned can convert it to glucose. This is probably the primary thing, right? And then if there's really way too much, it can also convert amino acids to lipids. So I hate to break it to you, any Atkins lovers out there, right? If you eat a ton of protein, a ton of amino acids, right? The liver can still decide what to do with that, right? It will still make uh, fats out of that if you have excess. The other thing the liver is gonna do here right, is um, when it does a deamination of amino acids, right, so in order to make glucose, it has to rip the nitrogen group off. So deamination is removing the nitrogen, the amine group, from that amino acid. 
that nitrogen is going to be put into the form of ammonia, which is a waste. The liver can also convert that then to urea, which is more water soluble, and we're able uh, to get rid of that. Um, let's see. Okay, so, and this kind of feeds into other things that we're doing, right? So you can also consider that kind of waste removal. So we had our three main macromolecules, and then we're also removing wastes, right? Things like urea, but also drugs, toxins. You could put alcohol into either or both of those categories, right? And the liver, of course, is famous um, for breaking that down. What the liver ends up doing is any of these toxins and wastes that it can, it wants to help eliminate from the body. Um, things that it doesn't think it can effectively get rid of, it will go ahead and store them to help protect the rest of the body. And so that's kind of important to think about, um, liver being this storage place um, for toxins as well. So waste removal, we also, we're still under metabolic regulation, um, we can do vitamin storage. So this is particularly your fat soluble vitamins. Mm, do you know those? A, D, E, and K, good. And we also store the water soluble uh, B12, right, is able to be stored here in the liver as well, right? Huge numbers of different functions for the liver. It does mineral storage. The mineral that we're thinking of, did your mom make you eat liver because it was high in iron? Mine did. Too bad it's also like the storage place for toxins, right? But um, it is a very rich store um, of iron. And then also consider this a really important site of drug inactivation. So part of the reason that you have to, to take doses, maybe on a regular basis of certain drugs, is that the liver is busy taking them apart, right? So you pop an Advil and your liver sees this molecule and says, okay, how do we get rid of this, right? Or antibiotics, any of those kind of things. Um, and so the liver is doing that function as well. Okay, so all of that fits under this idea of metabolic regulation. How about hematologic regulation? Let's see if we get a little more room here. Right? That was the other second big role of the liver. Again, this is revolving um, around blood. So for example, when we were in the blood system, we talked about plasma proteins. The liver makes the majority of these plasma proteins. Right? So things like albumin, which were so important for that osmotic pull, right, drawing fluids into the bloodstream. It makes some of our transport proteins that we talked about back in the endocrine system, right, carrying um, hormones around the body. It builds clotting proteins that we saw as part of hemostasis. Right? It even makes complement, complement protein, I'm apparently abbreviating protein with a P, uh, complement proteins that were part of that innate immune system, right? So, so um, many important proteins that the liver is able to produce. Okay. It also um, has Kupfer cells. Let's see if I can spell Kupfer, two Fs. These Kupfer cells, these are essentially macrophages that stay in the liver. And look how many there are in this picture, right? And I do think this artist is actually being fairly 
uh, realistic here, right? Because we're bringing so many things out of the digestive system straight to the liver, we are on the lookout um, for invaders. So another part, right, of our innate immune system. We also use the liver to remove hormones. Remember we said hormones get used up either as they bind to the receptor on the cell that they're targeting or as something like the liver or the kidney eliminates them, right? So the liver is constantly breaking down hormones that are released, which is actually good. It's like erasing the board so that the gland that is producing that hormone can send a signal, right? It's not just writing over um, all the hormones that have already been released. So we do remove hormones. We also remove antibodies. Same thing, once you've recovered from illness, you've produced vast numbers of these antibodies, of these proteins, and we're actually gonna go ahead and get rid of some of them because they're made out of protein and amino acids are really expensive. So we're gonna break them down, we'll leave some, um, but we don't need the full amount. Your liver, your liver is the one doing it. And then, maybe repetitive here, right? But it fits under this as well. Instead of letting those toxins just circulate through the bloodstream, we go ahead and remove them as much as we can, and again, store the ones that we can't. Particularly um, if they're fat-soluble toxins, they're likely to end up being stored by the liver. Okay, so that's hematologic regulation. But not least, so metabolic regulation, hematologic regulation, and bile production, right? And so all these little green uh, lines here, these are picking up bile that's being produced by liver cells, right? Bringing it into um, larger and larger um, ducts. Here we see the actual bile duct. We can go back um, to our picture here. Man, the model in the lab is actually really uh, better. There's a bile duct. You basically end up with a right and left um, bile duct coming in um, and you can fill the gallbladder with that bile or you can send that bile down the common bile duct out to the duodenum, right? The gallbladder is where bile is stored. So do keep that straight, the liver is producing bile, um, and then the gallbladder is storing it. And what is bile? Bile is going to be used to help digest fats. It's said to emulsify fats which basically just means putting them into smaller blobs, right? Um, think of it kind of like shaking up salad dressing. You know how you have that like, whole layer of oil sitting on top? It's this big blob. As you shake it up and you can break it into those little droplets, that's emulsification, right? And so bile is doing that so that it's easier for us to absorb um, the lipids that we've consumed, okay? It also, is giving those lipids more surface area for enzymes to act on. So, the liver is a phenomenal organ, be nice to your liver. The bile that the liver produces and is stored in the gallbladder is then released by the gallbladder in response to actually lipids in the duodenum, in the small intestine. And this is kind of brilliant, right? So, when fats are consumed, we release the hormone cholecystokinin, CCK. Cholecystokinin. It's literally like, kinin is like kinesiology movement, cyst is a sac, and so it's like this hormone that moves the sac to release bile. Um, and so that is actually timed, the release is timed into the intestines to match your diet. Now, someone who has their gallbladder removed, the liver continues to create bile and continuously secrete it, but now it's gonna kinda constantly be leaking down 
um, that bile duct and into the intestines. So it's just not timed properly, which can lead to some gastric upset. We're getting there. This is a really long chapter, but we are in the large intestine, the final organ of the digestive system. So a couple things to look at here. Recall the final portion of the small intestine, the ileum, has to go through an ileocecal valve to enter the first portion of the large intestine, which is called the cecum. It's this little extra kind of pouch here. The appendix hangs off of the cecum, and while many people will tell you it is a vestigial organ, I am here to tell you that we're considering it part of the lymphatic system. It is very richly endowed with galt, right, with that lymphoid tissue, and so that's what we're going to go ahead um, and call the appendix. Um, now you'll go through different structures um, here in lab, right, but the large intestine is sometimes also called the colon, right, so you have the cecum, the colon, and then the final portion is called the rectum. Now the rectum is typically empty, and it's when um, the, the feces, the waste products of digestion, start moving down and actually push against the walls of the rectum that we get this defecation reflex. So we won't get too crazy here, but do notice, right, as the waste enters the rectum, that actually triggers what they're calling here this short reflex, a very localized reflex, but it actually starts increasing the peristalsis, right? So actually kind of pushing a little harder. We're then going to trigger what they're calling this long reflex, which actually is going back to the spinal cord, right? So central nervous system, spinal cord, and we are actually going to contract the external anal sphincter. This is involuntary, right? It just happens. And this is awesome because this means that unless we override that, right, when we voluntarily relax that external sphincter, that is when defecation is going to take place. So for the most part, this works out pretty well. We get to decide when um, and where we want to relieve ourselves. Okay. Other things here um, in the large <clears throat> intestine. So if we think about the functions of the large intestine, it is this place where we're able to store, store storage of digestive wastes right, until there's a more convenient place um, to leave them. We do absorb some things here. It's less than 10% of absorption, but this is still important primarily, right, the biggest thing that we probably absorb is water, or the thing that we absorb the most of is water, right? And this large intestine houses a diverse array of bacteria. This is a super important part of your microbiome. Some of these bacteria are helping us digest, and some of them are helping produce vitamins for us. Um, so again, storing these wastes until defecation. I'm just going to add to the list here. When we think about absorption, right? Again, it's less than 10% of all absorption, but we are. We're absorbing um, important things like water. We are also absorbing some of those vitamins that the bacteria are making for us, right? Otherwise. If they make them in the large intestine, and then we just lose them, right? So we do some um, absorption here. And the, the vitamins that we're really thinking about um, are vitamin K. And that, remember, is important for clotting. There's a vitamin called biotin. And that's going to be important in glucose metabolism. And then B5. Right? Vitamin B5. Um, it's important in some like neurotransmitters. Okay, so those are again clotting. You should recognize that one. Other things that we're absorbing here, we do absorb um, some parts of bile, what they call bile salts, and we also absorb bilirubin. Right. 
Remember bilirubin, it was this breakdown of red blood cells. The liver was actually packaging this into bile. We used it in digestion, um, and now we're gonna reabsorb it. And this is a little weird, because it is a waste, um, but we will see that bilirubin um, end up, uh, it helps make feces kind of a yellowish, brownish color. We reabsorb it, and we're gonna remove it through the kidney. Um, to enter the urine. So a little bit weird because this really is um, a waste product. These bile salts at least will get uh, recycled and used again in the production of bile um, and that's just going to get eliminated by the kidney. I want you to pay close attention to figure 2427. It does a nice job of summarizing the digestion of our nutrients, right? Again, we have these more complex molecules that we're consuming and we need to break them into their individual smallest parts, right? Monomers, things like a monosaccharide or an amino acid or a fatty acid, right? So we need to do that in order to achieve the goal of the whole digestive system, which is in fact absorption of those nutrients. And so this figure does a really nice job of summarizing, right? So it goes through our different macromolecules. Here we see that carbohydrates, digestion begins in the oral cavity with salivary amylase, right? We're able to pass through the esophagus untouched. That salivary amylase can continue its work um, in the stomach, and so we get a little broken down, things like disaccharides or trisaccharides. In the small intestine, remember we saw pancreatic alpha amylase, so another enzyme to break down sugars, and it really is at the brush border on those microvilli where we have the enzymes lactase, maltase, and sucrase. They break down lactose, maltose, and sucrose are disaccharides. So we're making that final break here, right? We are then able to bring those monosaccharides like glucose into our cell, right? And then transport them. Um, and when I say transport, don't get too caught up. They do go into great detail about how this happens. Right, but you should know what facilitated diffusion is. It's diffusion, it moves down its concentration gradient, but we're gonna need a protein um, in order for this to happen, right? There we are in a capillary as part of our hepatic portal system. Here we are with lipids. Again, beginning in the oral cavity, we have lingual lipase, right? In the small intestine, remember we had the bile and we also had pancreatic lipase. So we're gonna increase um, our digestion again. Right? And we've broken those down into, we should do this, we've packaged them in what are called micelles. And these are really just little spheres, little blobs um, that are carrying these fatty acids. Right? That's going to allow us to diffuse into these intestinal cells and we are going to repackage that lipid. Right? We convert it into a triglyceride. So we kind of unpack this micelle, take its fatty acids, convert them to triglycerides, and then repackage it in the form called a chylomicron. That chylomicron, then we use exocytosis, bulk transport, and we move it into that lacteal. Remember, we don't go uh, into the bloodstream. For proteins, right, we don't begin digestion, right, nothing happens in the mouth. We don't begin digestion until we hit the stomach, um, where pepsin is able to start its activity. So we break that protein down to a polypeptide, a chain, right. In the small intestine, remember all those proteolytic enzymes, um, proteases and peptidases. You don't have to know the individual um, ones there, just realize those classes Look at this, a whole list of them, um, right? And again, that gets us to these small sections, maybe even a dipeptide. And here we see again at the brush border on our microvilli, we have dipeptidases. These are gonna break us down to those individual amino acids that then get absorbed into our cell, right? Again, are carried into the hepatic portal system, okay? So there is a lot going on there, but it's kind of a nice summary of what we talked about um, 
as we were going through different organs. So make sure you look over that image. And then finally, um, just a couple thoughts on um, absorption. So they have this nice graph showing um, absorption of water. And the thing I love about it, don't memorize the numbers, right? But I thought this is pretty fun, right? So you're drinking a lot of water, right? There's water in your food, but look at all these secretions that we put into the digestive tract, right? A liter and a half of saliva, a liter and a half of, of hydrochloric acid and other gastric secretions. Um, the liver is producing um, a liter, that seems like a crazy amount, of bile. The pancreas has a liter, a couple liters um, of intestinal secretions. A lot of that is going to be osmosis bringing this in. Anyway, when we get to the small intestine is absorbing a lot of that water, and then we also see the large intestine playing a really important role um, in kind of solidifying the waste products um, before we have to remove that, okay? And again, it's not just water, we're absorbing tons of different nutrients, ions, um, et cetera, in this pretty amazing system.